Let me ask you a question. Yep. So how is that first role that you sing, how is it for you to sing opera? Okay, I'll be real open here. The most legit thing that I had sung, role I'd sung, was Pan Gloss and Six Others in Candide at the Alliance in 1988, right? And I, and 20 years before I was artistic director, mostly what I was doing was musicals. And, um, and I remember when I got the role in Candide, uh, they called me back in and said, oh, we just want to test if you've got a high G. Well, I didn't know if I had a high G or not, but I did it. I just went for it. And uh, it was this great shifting point. And so, um, when you cast me in the abduction from the Seraglio, uh, that was tremendous because it was a non-singing role and it was acting and you had seen me perform, so I thought, I can do this. And I had no idea what it was like to do what I do as an actor, but on the scale of Mozart and the Cobb Energy Center and how the aria was a dialogue. It wasn't just me hanging out on stage with Constanza, it's that relationship. So then when you t started talking to me about um, Out of Darkness and that I would actually sing, I had that same sense that I had with Candide. I can do this. And a lot of that was you. It just a lot of that was you. Your trust. So I worked on it and worked on it as best as I c could. And then I set up a, a appointment with Rolando last August, so it's about seven months out, and I was all prepared in my expectations for Rolando to say something of the effect of, Tom, I think we got a problem, we need to talk to Tomer, yeah. you just don't meet up to the standard, but instead, he looked at me and went, bravo, and I felt yeah. like I had landed on a different shore, and uh, what John said, it's like I get to sing with no holes barred. Uh, I, and that's the most wonderful thing about this is there's no holding back. There's no holding back. The body becomes an instrument, a voice when words no longer will suffice. And the way the song is, it's a call to action. So, it doesn't feel like I'm doing anything differently. And after the first rehearsal, when I still wasn't fired, <laughs> and then it was like, yeah, you got this. Now let's get into the rehearsal and do the work. And so it's all part of just telling the story. Yeah, yeah and I think too that when you live in this you know, incredible opera mm -hmm. and you spend time in it, you build up such an intention, there's such purpose when you begin that finale. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. you just unleash it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when you say it's a call. But, you know, I've seen you on stage over the years in many, many things, and I can do it as a Tom Key trait, you know? That's, that's your character. But it definitely, every time that you're with the opera, and just the same time, we stretch you a little bit. You, you know? do. Abduction, your costume was yeah, stretched yeah, you. Yeah, when I went in for my fitting, Joanna Schmink, who I've known for years, looks at me and says, are you ready? <laughs> and I said, well, I think so. And then I went in and I put on the pants and I said, so where's the rest of the costume? <laughs> and That's it? Yeah, that was pretty much it. The chains and the nose and... and uh, yeah, it was amazing. Well, that's and, good for the budget. <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah, and it's, it's part of that, um, you know, life is so, life is the miracle, right? And that's what I'm beginning to get about opera, is that we need an art form to go to that scale that is that big, and the stakes are life and death, whether it's a comedy or a, so to let the whole body and vocal cords and mind and soul be available to that is fantastic. You know what's interesting about what you just said is that 
opera has a very long tradition. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that it also has this horizon that is filled with all kinds of possibilities. Yeah. And that's what's wonderful about Tomer coming to Atlanta Opera, because those possibilities are getting realized. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what's remarkable. And as a choreographer, you know, choreography, most people think it's about steps. Right. You know, it's about being on the music and all this sort of thing. And it's so much more than that. And so here's this small cast of individuals in this beautiful production of, you know, Out of Darkness to Remain, who are singers, who are actors, right. who are dancers. Right. Every single individual is all three of those. Yeah, yeah. That's so unique. I've never witnessed it. Mm -hmm. And I've worked mm -hmm. in opera over the years. And that's what's really fresh. Uh -huh. And what's so stimulating being in a process like this is that those young singers are open. Right. They are available. Mm -hmm. They are comfortable. Tomer, you engage everyone. You, you are provocative sometimes in asking questions. Who are you now? What are you doing this for? Yeah, right. And it stimulates all kinds of responses because each individual has immersed themselves in the study of the era yeah. and the history of it. Yeah. You know, of course. But they're all different. Right. And what's interesting to me, too, is they're very young. Yeah. Yeah. And so their youth even brings new ideas and freshness into play. Right. And, and they trust each other. So everything ends up being very authentic. Right. You know, because no one has, it's like when I came here for this production, you know, I had no opinions. Mm -hmm. You know, I immersed myself in the history too, the era, the people, what happened and who they were. And, uh, but it was an open slate. Yeah. You know, and as much as we've been telling stories, the three of us, uh -huh. all our lives, right. this is storytelling that is a very special kind of collaboration. Because as many years as we've been doing it, you still have this capacity to discover. Yeah. Every sure. time we're together in that room or in the theater, you identify yeah. each of you, and so does the cast, all these incredible moments of relationships and they increase their capacity to deeply understand. I felt like the audience today in the rehearsal and I was mesmerized because they were each drawing me in yeah. because they were distinctive and yes. unique. Yes. You know, it's like in yeah. the war and all these people that they came from all kinds of different backgrounds. People right. died in the Holocaust from all over Europe. Right. You know, and they, they were homosexuals and they were the fringe people, a lot of them. Right. And not just the Jews. Right. You know, and the gypsies and everybody else. And that's what I feel when I was in the audience today in the theater. It was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you told me about your previous experience in opera, which was very different. So what was your first opera, and how is it compared to this one? Well, the, the, the early operas that I did when I was young were Aida, Fledermaus, but I was actually... Uh, given the opportunity to do a world premiere with the San Francisco Opera, which was Angle of Repose, which was a Pulitzer Prize winning novel by uh, Wallace Stegner. And anyway, the singers pretty much stand and sing very nice things. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And there's no, nobody moves. And it's not cinematic. Yeah. You know, it's very static, to be honest. And uh, I can say that Out of Darkness to Remain is certainly not static. No, no. <laughs> That's it's the, the big difference. Yeah. yeah. I think what we're watching today is a really interesting process because what you're talking about was very prevalent in the opera world in the 20th century. And then somehow in the 21st century, there's a revolution, there's like a renaissance in the subjects of operas. It's no longer about kings and queens, and mm -hmm. right. it's, it's about people. Right. You know, think about the subject for this opera, but also the training for those singers and what they're willing to do 
and how much they're willing to push themselves as actors, yes. as, as people that move well, it all is a package. And they realize that, and that's why I think it makes this a viable performance, because it's no longer a singer planting herself in the middle of the stage and doing strange gestures in Italian. You know, it's mm -hmm. a different world. Yeah, that's yeah. pantomime. Yeah, yeah. And another part of the value of this kind of collaboration that you invite is we get to learn from one another your, your uh, priorities and your practices. We're all doing the same thing. We're all telling a story. But the way we rehearse, the way we prepare, the way we choose what we're going to do, when to present, um, that's very exciting because I think under these art forms, if you think of them separately, opera, ballet, modern dance, theater, musical theater, uh, what starts happening is that there are cultures that build up around it. Um, and there are certain expectations around that. When you say a Broadway musical, you have certain expectations uh, about the culture and so how you prepare for that. Or you say you're going to the opera, you have certain expectations. And what I see happening now, as so much has changed with technology, so much has changed just in the idea of what we mean by culture. Um, and so that, uh, for example, here's something that I've just lived long enough to sort of see my way through. The first Broadway play I saw was before the rock musical and in the introduction of the microphone. And so when I was in my training as an adolescent, we were performing uh, musicals in a 2,000 seat theater with no microphones. Mm -hmm. right. Because at that time, right. the singer knew how to project and the orchestra knew how to support. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was at a prominent theater in the early 80s uh, doing The Rivals, uh, restoration comedy, and there was a lovely, beautiful actress from LA who was brought in to do a role, and she just couldn't project across the footlights, and they brought a microphone in on this play in an 800-seat theater, and I thought, this is the beginning of the end. And so what happened is that actors have been trained to perform with a microphone. Yeah. And to begin to project out of not just technique to be heard, but out of intention to be understood by every vo voice member. Now see, this is something that you, it struck me at the Alliance Theater yeah. when I saw Three Decembers. Yeah. And the voiceover came over and said, because opera does not perform with microphones, please turn off your cell phones. And everybody had so much respect for that. Oh my God, they're, they're singing to us because that's what they can do. Well, see, I think that um, there's such a, a, an overwhelming of the soundscape that it's impossible to understand the lyrics and the story. In, in other words, every art form can sort of like, um, what do you call those things that glom on to piers and the water of, it starts with a B. Uh, barnacles. Barnacles. I have them all <laughs> over my body. Right. It's, <laughs> right, right, right. It's like uh, cultural barnacles form around uh, because this is who's producing the musical or the opera. And so you think, well, that just must be essential to the art form. But if it doesn't facilitate telling the story, you need to re take an inventory. Now in this day and time, with the technology we have, with the, what's of concern, what can we scrape off? to get down to the essential elements. Well, that's really important because when you talk about voice, so much of it is artificial. You go into a, you know, a studio yeah. and everything's manipulated. Yeah. <clears throat> and a lot of people can't sing very well, but <clears throat> that's part of the world of commerce. Yeah. You know? But the other thing too, there's so many layers and dimensions to the complexity of the world today mm -hmm. compared to when Giuseppe Verdi was uh, writing mm -hmm. operas. Mm -hmm. And there's, a, there's kind of this overabundance and there's kind of this consumer idea of what you need and there's a frenzy and uh, there's, there, there's anxiety. People are sitting in their cars and they can't get anywhere, you know, and they're all yeah, yeah. pent up. Yeah. 
And yeah. that influences people's commitments to anything. So yeah. anyway, yeah. it's two things. It's getting rid of the artifice, and that's what the singers, actors, dancers do in this opera. It's real, yeah. and it's yeah. really vivid, and they love each other as characters. You really, it's tangible. You know, it's yes. palpable. Yes. And the emotions when these events occur inside of this tragedy, these people being brought together under these circumstances. Yeah. And then there's the music. It's appalling. Oh, the music. Well, the music is, oh. that's the whole landscape. That's the whole intent right there. It is. It is. T uh, two things on that. One is um, the realness that's required. Um, and the and the voice and the projection, I, I directed uh, um, a show in another theater, not at Theatrical Outfit, and it was smaller than Theatrical Outfit, only about 150 seats, and they required the actors to use microphones, sure. and and it just it it sep that separates you. You're being you're being touched by the artist with it's it's like art with a condom you know there's something in between you and 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 the art and so building the Balser theater Herons uh, for theatrical outfit there's always compromises you have to make we would have loved to have had more storage shop hospitality space but we did not want to compromise the relationship between the actor and the audience and I had no idea that one day uh, the new director of the Atlanta Opera would come and say this is where we can perform a chamber opera and that so that we could get the the uh, unprotected uh, uh, voice and spirit and flesh and blood of the artists there and be heard and be affected. The other thing is that I've noticed is after 9-11 and the world witnessed this um, all of our uh, perspectives were forever changed. Uh, most people I talked to when they heard what had happened imagined a small plane bouncing off the there was you had to see it to believe it and seeing that kind of horror and now um, meant that we had a responsibility to um, reflect on our stages the reality of life not that it's grim and horrific but the light that comes through that too um, the episodic television now is so fine and so wonderful so that has to be reflected uh, in our art form too in live performance and you know the 9-11 event <clears throat> was the first cataclysmic horror event that was man-made in the United States of America. Mm. So I think that had an intense impact <clears throat> on people's responses. You know, we fought wars on everybody else's soil. You know, we had the Civil War, of course, but yeah. When, yeah. when you think of the context of your relationship to the world, that's the first big event where something from outside caused this unbelievable happening, and it was a wake-up call. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you're performing your role, yeah. and it's very intense and moving. When the lights come down and you have that moment before the audience starts to applaud, and hopefully they'll applaud, what do you want them to think? How do you want them to go home? Oh, wow. Um, I believe, I tell you, I, this has been one of the scariest, most demanding, most difficult characters and situations in which I have ever made myself vulnerable to as an actor. Why? Because the, there is no holding back on in this story and the way it's written in the music and in the libretto of what is horrible and dark and cruel and beyond comprehension in the human experience and the payoff 
of that, I found there's some, wow, the music, Jake Heggie's music, and um, Ben's performance, and you and the creative team there, knowing sort of like uh, ER people, <laughs> you know, knowing we're safe, and we go through this story. I am, I believe acting is revealing who I am is as appropriate to the character in the script. So I become a man at the end of my life who lost his one true love and have had to suffer um, societal condemnation for who I am. And I have steeled myself in order to survive. And I don't dare hope again. Mm. I don't dare hope again to make myself that vulnerable. And then my true love comes back to me and invites me to come with him and to be vulnerable again. And so that even though it's the most horrific nightmare which is I'm experiencing there is some power in the sound of the music in the sound of Ben singing to me of Manfred singing to me the way he he looks at me the way he touches me the way I respond to him that I can continue through and it gets to something very primal in our existence that, that we are bound together with one another. We're not alone. We are not alone. And through that journey I take with him, I can finally hope again so that by the end the tears and the breathlessness of horror had been transforming into the wonder of a new reality into which I am entering. And I believe the audience will go with us if they just show up and give us that much of a chance. And that they with, with Gad will know what it is to come out of real darkness and everybody in that audience we all have our darkness and some people are still stuck there and they're afraid to go back to it because when they hear the subject matter but that's the that's the value of art that it allows us to give meaning to it it allows us to give meaning to it so I feel by the end of it connected to Manfred to the greater community, the possibility of even my father, all of those who I thought couldn't understand who I am, to a greater hope. It's a happy ending in a way. It is a beautiful ending. It is a beautiful ending. Well, Manfred's uh, whole commitment to uh, that choice of not staying with you and joining his family Yes. And the lyrics and the music and how he sings that. He's the vortex of everything you just said. I know, in, I know. In that whole second act. Yeah. And it's a catharsis. Yes. Yeah. And you, and you know what's interesting, too, that I think is so brilliant about the writing. If there's, and when I read uh, Gad Beck's, uh, Beck's autobiography, what really struck me was the cost of going underground. Uh, but what is fantastic about the story is how there's no judgment for someone, and many people did, who could have escaped but did not want to leave their family. And then those who, under different circumstances, made a choice to go underground. And they both served a purpose. I remember after seeing my first, and when I was in graduate school, 
is when I really saw some of the heavy duty documentaries about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think I went into a depression for about three years. I, I had no idea that that was imaginable. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I came across, and you'll, you might have to help me with pronouncing this author's name, uh, Elie Wiesel? Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel. Yeah. His book, uh, Night. Night. That helped me through. That, that for me was what I think out of darkness is going to be for a lot of people because what he saw and what he witnessed and that he, what he concluded was out of suffering can come great meaning. Yeah. And that has, that has really been hopeful and that's a huge part of out of darkness. That, that's one of the things we talked about when we uh, started working on this is the fact that I grew up in Israel in the 80s, mm -hmm. surrounded by thousands of stories that we were required to study in schools. Incredible st stories about six million people, six million Jewish people that were killed in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But no one ever mentioned anything about 100,000 members of the LGBT community right. that were also persecuted. Right. And so when I learned about it, and I'm ashamed to say I didn't learn about it until I read the libretto of Out of Darkness. Right. I felt that especially on, in this day and age, we got to tell that story. Yes. It's blow my mind. Yeah. The you fact know? that uh, paragraph 175, the documentary, was done in 2000 about these, they located about 10 gay men who had survived the Holocaust and did interviews with about six or eight of them. And Gad Beck was actually the youngest. And because of that documentary in 2000 was why the U.S. Holocaust Memorial in D.C. included homosexuals who had suffered because of their sexuality in that museum. And that gay men could not get reparations for having suffered from the Nazi regime. Yeah. Um, so it's the education of the storytelling too. Yeah. Not to say this is right or wrong, but just listen to these facts. Listen to this other human being story. Well, it's been fantastic to talk with both of you. I feel like we can talk for hours and hours. Hi. Days. I do. I, I think Days. so too. But let's, we got to run and finish the show. That's yeah. right. Let's go tech. That's right. That's we can continue this oh, later. Let's get out. <laughs> All right. Okay. Bye. <laughs>